Thank you, Helen, and uh, the organizers for inviting me here. I'm very pleased to be providing maybe a slightly different perspective, certainly a different field of science, and try to answer that question before lunch, you know, what about the ocean? Because when I think of Fukushima, I think of an ocean event. Uh, so I'm doing that from a perspective of someone who's uh, started out working here in Woods Hole. It's a beautiful place on Cape Cod. We have about 850 uh, employees, scientists studying the oceans in all aspects. We're independent, we're not for profit. That's come up several times. We rely on private and uh, government funding for each of us individually. So we're kind of like the individual entrepreneurs. And I'm going to give you a perspective of going there as a student in 86. Well, actually, I graduated in 86, which of course is the year of Chernobyl. I was focused on, I went there because some of the pioneers of studying fallout, cesium, plutonium in the oceans, were in Woods Hole. And I was trying to learn more about the fate of those isotopes from the 60s, where they ended up in the 80s when Chernobyl went off. Because of that accident, I stayed. I was a student they never got rid of. And uh, we immediately started studying the Black Sea and the consequence to that basin from some of the fallout from uh, Chernobyl. So well, this event happened. I had actually moved out of this field. I was looking at radionuclides in the ocean, but more for climate studies, nutrients. But when we heard about the accidents, when I talked to some of the Japanese scientists, I'll show you some of the data, uh, we immediately knew we had to get there and find out independent confirmation. What are the levels? How bad was it? And this is just a picture of a ship from the University of Hawaii. We were very fortunate to find very quick funding. This is in uh, June of 2011. Uh, typically, I plan cruises uh, two, three years ahead of time. So between the time when the uh, Moore Foundation came through with the funding and we were on the docks in Yokohama, it was about six weeks. Unbelievable. Uh, great cooperation, by the way, from both uh, American people and the embassies there, the Japanese scientists who wanted this to happen but maybe weren't, couldn't be as vocal about that. Uh, but we were able to get permission uh, actually somewhat after we had left the docks, but the sample within 30 kilometers and outwards from there. I'll show you some of our data. Uh, but so I was very fortunate to be able to pull that together. It was also very international. Uh, we had, uh, let's see, France, Spain, uh, the UK, America, and many Japanese scientists both on board and that we shared samples with after. So we tried to encourage that intercalibration. I'm a research scientist. I want to see how my data compare to someone else's. And the only way to do that in these situations is to have the same water in hand and do the same analyses. So that was a big part of this. Now, I spent my career trying to measure what are really small amounts of radioactivity in an ocean, I say a sea of radioactivity. That's not to say you know, radioactivity is not a problem, but typically when you're an oceanographer, there's many, many more decay events, radionuclides out there that occur naturally. We've heard about potassium-40, we've heard about uranium-238, I guess we haven't yet. But these, if you add up how much is in the ocean, again, we're an ocean planet, most of the volume here is, is the big numbers are because we're in a big ocean planet, are in units of our petabacarels that we heard earlier this morning. So these are the million billion becquerels, these decay events. So there's a lot of potassium-40. I have to get out of my sample to measure a little bit of cesium. And we'll get back to the relative levels but we should also realize then typically the amounts of the cesium from things like global nuclear weapons testing, the largest source to date, uh, might be 400 in the units of petabecquerels. Chernobyl, we heard earlier, 85. Fukushima, we'll talk about. Three Mile Island was really a triv trivial release of that isotope. So that's something we have to live with. Uh, we heard about bananas, and we shouldn't make the comparison, but I think actually I disagree a little bit. You know, if we look at the radioactivity and the response, these are beta emitters that have similar energies, and so we actually can make some comparisons. But the point here on this slide is that there's much smaller amounts of radiation in the ocean that we can measure than are generally considered harmful to us. And that applies to both things like cesium and things like uranium or potassium-40. So we can measure one becquerel or less in my lab. Uh, I do that over several days in very expensive Geiger counters. Mine are more like sixty dollars to $100,000 encased in lead to remove some of the background radiation where we sit for a very long time looking for trace amounts of these isotopes. And of course, we have to realize that in the ocean, just as our human body, these different radionuclides will have different effects, different toxicity. Uh, I'm going to focus really only on the cesium data. I just don't have time. And what do we know about cesium? 
Well, that first slide, most of it's from those weapons tests in the atmosphere in the 1960s, including some of the islands tests. So the Pacific actually has higher amounts of cesium than other ocean basins because of the uh, Marshall Islands and the tests that we conducted there. Uh, it was one of the major Fukushima radionuclides of concern. We've heard enough about that. We've heard about the two isotopes. They would have similar chemical properties, whether it's 134 cesium, a two-year half-life, or 137, the one that's around for decades, 30-year half-life, they'll behave the same. Because of that, it's actually something we call the fingerprint. You know, we can actually detect, if we see a certain amount of cesium in a seawater sample, I can tell you what fraction came directly from that power plant versus something like the testing in the 60s. That's quite important because we have all of these different sources to kind of figure out where they're from. So I actually have a very nice method, uh, it's not unique to me, but everyone in this field, to use the isotope ratio of 134 to 137. They were released by chance in some ways by design of the reactors in equal quantities, radioactivity quantities, that ratio was one. So why is this an ocean event? Well, there's a little mock-up of the Fukushima power plants. Uh, this is a cartoon taken from a talk by some Japanese showing the releases to the air. We heard about the atmospheric releases. The clouds and rain are really the main vector for atmospheric deposition over the ocean. And we'll talk about the numbers a little bit later too. And that was peaking in mid-March, so we had an atmospheric source to the ocean. What you've heard about but may not consider is this direct discharge, and I'll show you data from the ocean, suggests it actually might be more important for the ocean how much leaked out of those buildings uh, during and after the accident itself. Something you haven't heard very much about, but of course, the fallout on land also can make its way into the ocean, so rivers are a small source. Uh, groundwater, we've actually heard alluded to, there's probably the least amount of data I've seen is on the groundwater concentrations and what's getting into the ocean. So from my perspective, some of the largest uncertainties. And we've also heard, but I wanted to remind you that you know, more than 80% of all of those sources ended up in the ocean. Uh, so that's a large source of contamination. But there's probably the least amount of sampling. I'm just envious of all these maps that have thousands of data points and people holding Geiger counters. There's very few data from the ocean, so there's still large uncertainties in what I'll be talking about, about the quantity in the ocean, where it went. But I'll try and summarize as best I can. So some graphs. Uh, there's a timeline here on the bottom axis from April 1st to basically one year later in 2012. I'm going to be talking exclusively in unison becquerels. This is the amount of cesium per cubic meter. So this is a concentration of, of cesium in seawater. The little map, I don't think we really need it, but it just shows those red dots from right at the reactor itself, but in the ocean. So these are people going out, taking samples of seawater, bringing them back in. I've had to use this crazy tall and logarithmic scale to get the range of concentrations we're going to talk about here because the lowest number here is on the bottom left. It's the level prior to March 11th was about one and a half becquerels per cubic meter. That's how much cesium was in the ocean off Japan. Each red point is a sampling by an individual taken in, actually released by TEPCO, Kind of complicated to find the data, but they were openly released. And if I translate them into the right units and make some corrections, uh, each red dot would tell me how much radioactivity was at that point along the coast on a given date. So they start out here around 10,000, the very first measurements that were made. They're peaking up here up to 50 million. That's a very alarmingly high number. And we'll talk a bit about the change over time. Uh, at that level of tens of millions of becquerels, that's when you certainly would have some of the effects we just heard on land, reproductive effects, actually mortality. Uh, the other thing about this, when I first heard some of these numbers, you know, the highest we'd ever seen in Chernobyl are down here below 1,000. So this was certainly unprecedented. We hadn't seen cesium levels this high. Now there's some you know, good news, bad news. Uh, I guess I should talk first about why it peaked later than the accident. So we talked about March 11th was the earthquake, about the 15th was some of the increases in the radioactive in, in the atmosphere that the highest. There were actually leaks in the buildings and in the subterranean parts of that plant. And some of those were actually pouring into the ocean at levels that were uh, very high here at the early days. You heard about people maybe burning their feet, some of the responses. So that's what was getting in the ocean. They plugged that hole, 
And, you know, you plug a hole. If you're putting something in the ocean, actually the concentrations go down. You get mixing in the ocean, things move off. It's not like when it falls on land and stays put. This very rapid decrease is because of ocean mixing processes. I'll show you how those work. What was kind of surprising to us when we published this first data was this, though, is that it actually never went back down to what it was. And so that implies a continued source. So you don't have a shape like this of a very quick decrease in early April into June, and then this without having some other supply that maintains cesium up here at about 1,000 relative to 1, so 1,000 times higher than it had been. Now, I do want to put this in perspective from health safety. I'm not a, a health physicist by any stretch. But I do want to point out, and I'll go back to, you know, there are about 12 becquerels of potassium-40 in bananas. There are levels of concern for drinking water in the U.S. It's about 8,000 in those units. So they have a regulatory limit of about 90,000. So they're allowed by law to put up to about 90,000 becquerels per cubic meter of cesium in the ocean by the operating license of TEPCO. Our plants have similar things. They're allowed to have certain levels in the ocean. That's because these are considered safe. And what we'll talk about at the last part of my talk is, well, what does that mean also for, that might be safe for your exposure, but what about the uptake into fish that we might be eating? So I'll end my talk with the seafood side. But first, some data about what happened. That was at the coast, right, those red dots. How about further away? We saw, you know, what was that, 50 million well, these numbers are now going to be more like several hundred, 500 becquerels. The height of this uh, tube, this is some Japanese data, is how much was there. This is April 2011, so very early on. My take on this, the most exciting things to us about what this told us is that some of it got pretty far away. That's about 1,000 kilometers, 600 miles away pretty quickly. That would be that atmospheric input. So it's there. It was spread throughout large areas of the Pacific Ocean. But then there are these hot spots up close, and our concern was what's going on closer to Japan, because those are the levels that we had most health concern on early on. This is April. We didn't know what was happening. So this is from our cruise in June. And so it's a map showing you the coast of Japan. The star is the location of the Fukushima. That gray kind of blob, uh, people here may not have heard of the Kurashio. We call it the Gulf Stream of the Pacific. It's a very fast current taking water basically offshore, and that gray just gives you kind of where it was in June when we sampled. Now, we were measuring our exposure uh, on the ship, actually more concerned about hitting debris than the radiation levels because they had come down significantly. Uh, but this map was produced after with kind of high accuracy methods, standards, and things to get actually what's causing that concentration different. Why is it? And what, again, strikes me is some of the numbers are going to be less than three down here, so very low levels, back to those background. And the big hot spot there is over 3,000, is 5,000 becquerels per cubic meter offshore. The last plot was 500, now we're back up to 5,000. What's going on to cause that pattern? Why is it high and why is it low in other areas? Now, the first thing you kind of can see, and I'll tell you the answer to is the low numbers are in the south. If you put cesium into the ocean in the north, basically the curse shield is going to be the barrier, the wall that keeps the cesium to the north of that. So that actually was important information for people living down here in Guam and other areas that the cesium contamination would be highest north of the curse shield. Now why is there a bullseye there? Why are there red circles here? well after the peak releases, that has to do with coastal currents and oceanography. So we had physical oceanographers on board who study where the currents are going. And they do that sort of like, you know, message in a bottle. They put out a satellite sensor on the surface of the ocean with a drogue so it moves with the currents and see where these go. It's that simple. And so there's a little eddy, a little circular motion here where water that was contaminated very highly would stay near the coast and not move offshore. So we took good advantage of that when we published this data and all of our data available to say we could tell something about the distribution by knowing the currents. And I'll show you some further examples of how that works. So here's more of that data with the squiggles. And just to show you, this gets to back to maybe the debris question too, but it's when you release these floats, so this is actually my floats with the GPS system on them, 
released at each of those black dots, that's what we were on the ship, and how far did they get, the color changes with time. So these colors out here in purple are the most recent readings of where they were, and these are the earlier readings. So you're seeing basically the progress across the Pacific Ocean of something that's following the water itself. Now, debris would actually move faster. Some of the things we heard about, the soccer balls, the things coming up on our coast, are above the water as well as in the water, and so the winds can push them even faster. But certainly the water itself would have crossed about 180 of the dateline, year, half of the Pacific Ocean, just over a year after the accident. That's something we know quite well and can actually model and have done a good job with. I'll show you one more example of that. This is a model of the plume and where it would go early days. Uh, we heard about that U.S. naval vessel and trying to be in this area and having to avoid other areas. They knew kind of right away, actually, some of those currents and how fast they'd be moving. This ends on April 30th. So you could actually have made predictions, and we were doing that, uh, of where things would end up. I'll just do that one more time. The biggest uncertainty in this not only is the quality of the input to the model, the winds, the currents that you go in there, but also was most of that cesium, this is a model run where all of the cesium they're looking at was released into the coast. This doesn't include the atmospheric release, so it's not a perfect view of things, but actually it's something we were using to guide our sampling. And these authors point out that it really tracks, the reason it looks like that snake moving out there is because of this Kurashio current. That's what's driving the transport of cesium across the Pacific. So how far and how fast? Uh, if you take the broader look of the Pacific Ocean and you look for the front of where you see the edge of the cesium moving, this goes till March 2012, about 180 degrees. This is actually based upon samples, not models, which kind of confirmed what I've been showing you. So this is an interesting slide. We held a symposium in November in Tokyo that was both a private scientific conference for two days with Japanese international scientists and a public forum after that. And some of the big questions were, well, what about today? Now, today was November of 2012, and this slide was given to me by Yota Kanda from this Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. So they took an area off the coast and drew a box around and said, well, how much cesium is in there at that time. Now, we heard earlier about the petabacarels. There was a lot of cesium. Well, now we've kind of decreased it because over time, there's less and less cesium in the ocean water off Japan. One of the bigger questions, and I don't have time to show you the data, but the seafloor itself has become contaminated. Now, this is not a big fraction of the many petabacarels that was released, but it's still there. A small amount of a big number is still a big number. So we have a situation by sampling those muds, by sampling the seafloor and counting how much cesium is there, we can compare that number to what we had looked in the seawater. And you find actually now there's actually more in the seafloor off of Fukushima than in the water. So if you're looking for effects, if you're looking for uh, where it's ended up, that's, that's where you should be looking. The other reason they did this is they were trying to confirm what I told you earlier because those red dots aren't going down. Why? There must be a source. So they actually did very careful studies of the rivers, and they found a sediment load as well as what we call dissolve, what's coming down with the water. And so some of the properties of these isotopes vary, and sometimes the sediment itself is the main source. It's also highly episodic, so rain events. If you don't sample right after the big rain, you're not going to capture the flow out, but certainly rivers continue to be a source and will be a source, uh, well, certainly over the half-life of cesium decades to come. The power plant itself, that's a harder number to get at. Again, we don't have groundwater samples. We don't have access to samples. Uh, we have data from their sampling, but not our own samples. But we get into a number that's certainly on the same scale as the rivers in terms of the releases through November. Uh, the data, the red dots I started showing you with all of the levels, I just looked yesterday. I found numbers through January. There's still about 1,000 to 10,000, mostly in the 1,000 level. They are coming down, but really slowly. Uh, so we still have this continued source that's of concern. But probably some pretty big error bars, but these are, these are true. It's not just my saying 
the levels are still high. This is a Japanese study with some careful analyses uh, from those areas. Another couple things. Uh, how much was released? We've seen a couple of estimates, and I've tried to put here on a graphical scale several different studies, and you don't have to know all the names, but there have been many of us who've been trying to get at the atmospheric release quantities. 10 to 40 is that range of petabecquerels of cesium-137, so just one isotope, how much came out in the atmosphere. There's a bigger range in those blue bars, how much came out into the ocean discharge, something like 3 to 15. Uh, I think there's some consensus. We think they're actually coming together, but uh, there's far fewer samples to constrain that blue numbers than there are the other numbers. But you put those together, I think we should do it. We need to compare the total release, say, of Fukushima to other sources. That global fallout, that amount that had come in the 60s, had decayed away. Uh, this is a number of 290 from 1970. I could have gotten a, a more recent number, but it's slowly decreasing. The amount in the North Pacific Ocean left from that, because that's a global number, is something like 70. So we're putting in another 15 to 30 petabecquerels over 70. And Chernobyl, as we heard a couple times, is about 80 in those units. But remember, Chernobyl was hundreds of kilometers from either the Baltic Seas to the north, the Black Sea to the south. And so most of that, only 10 or 20 percent got in the ocean. So again, still for the ocean, this is a larger event. And then just before the fish, you know, what's going on here? And this is kind of uh, my frustration in a way is we don't know many of these arrows very well, right? Uh, what this is supposed to be is the bottom of the ocean <laughs> drawn here. And what came in? Well, there's still big uncertainties on the atmospheric and direct discharges. We do know that cesium is soluble and moves with that current and will mix down. There are a lot of arrows we don't know very well. If you do oceanography, you're always trying to figure out fluxes and where things are accumulating. So we know very little about the seafloor settling. We've actually measured that directly. Several of us are looking at seafloor burial, transport of those sediments. This remineralization is, is a big unknown. And then the source from the power plant and the rivers itself and groundwater are probably the largest uncertainties. And that's just for cesium. We probably know more about cesium than any other. What about fish? Uh, what about all that cesium in the ocean? And, and this is a cartoon. I didn't take to make fun of this, but this is the information page from the Japanese Ministry of Forestry and Fisheries trying to explain in a very simple way what happens to the uptake of radioactive cesium isotopes in an ocean that has stable cesium, potassium, other salts in there. And certainly, some of that gets carried in, some of it gets excreted. Uh, we talked about concentration factors in one of the previous talks. It's only about a factor of 100. It's not like DDT and other things. The accumulation rate is not high. What's more important, too, is that the biological half-time, how long till it would release the cesium if you took the contaminated fish and put it in a clean aquarium, is something like 50 days. It's very short, some estimates longer some shorter. It depends on the fish, the life cycle, how active they are. So that's what we expect. Cesium in, cesium out, small concentration factors, but they should track what was in the water. So what did they find? Now this isn't my data, I'm not a fisheries scientist, but sort of like the TEPCO numbers, they've been releasing thousands and thousands of numbers with no interpretation. So we tried to take certain aspects of this and just say, what can we say? And the way I've plotted these is, in this slide, is all of the bottom-dwelling fish that they sample. It's from these different prefixtures here on the Japanese coast. They're taken to a lab, and someone looks at the total cesium concentration. And I've actually, just before this conference, reviewed their methods. I actually believe their methods. Uh, we could ask questions about that. I've had to use another logarithmic scale. But in each case, I've put the limit that's allowed in seafood, and we can talk some more, but it's now 100 becquerels per kilogram wet weight in fish. So anything above that line would be considered shouldn't be on the market, and that's the reason they're closing the fisheries. And what you immediately see is that off Fukushima, these fisheries are closed, the levels are too high. What I also saw in this, as we'll talk about in the next slide, is they're not really going down, and they're up and down. They can range from 10 or even below the axis here, up to several thousand for any given location and time. So regional differences, you might expect that because you saw where the cesium came into the ocean. Species difference, what type of fish are the most contaminated? And it's really the bottom fish and the freshwater fish that we have to be most concerned about. 
So up in red on the top are the demersal, the bottom fish, epipelagic and pelagic, those are more your open ocean fish, or certainly water column derived. Newston are collected in small nets. Uh, and then freshwater here, you see just as many above and below the line. We've published this last, late last fall. Uh, I got a lot of flack at the time that they're gonna go down, and so I'm gonna show you data now up through the end of last year. But basically the points we were making, and I think they're still valid today, is that the levels are still high in some of the fish types. It's an unpredictable variability. At that time, 18% of all of those fish they reported were above the limit. Uh, this is new, no one's seen this actually except this audience is, okay, I went back to that same data source. They had now actually locked the Excel spreadsheets that I had access to before, so I couldn't sort and plot them. I had to find through other sources the same data back so I could actually do this for you, but it was another plot. Now we're gonna go through 2012 till January, so 2013. Those same types of bottom dwelling fish and what's going on with them. And, you can certainly see there aren't really dramatic changes over the story we told last fall about those levels. They're still high. Now, these are levels in a fishery that's officially closed, so these are not being brought to market. They're selectively picking things like whelks and octopus that are not this contaminated to allow back to markets to try and rebuild the fisheries. Uh, we had one scientist in November arguing fishery science that we should just keep those fisheries closed. They're actually overfishing those areas anyway. Uh, it's also kind of odd to me, well, not odd, striking uh, as an oceanographer. There's thousands of data points up there and yet there's only a few hundred in the ocean. So if they ask me why, when's it gonna change? We can't answer that basic question. So the last thing I did as a geeky scientist is I wanted to see how fast they are changing because address this concern that, well, they are going down. So just bear with me. I switched axes, so you just have a linear axis so you can actually see things a little better. But I already know it's gonna be very hard to see, but this is the Fukushima bottom fish, those same red dots now just on a different scale. And you look closely, it gets a little bit more crowded here below the line than before. That's the Japanese limit. Things way up, way down, highly variable. 40% were above that line up until here. It actually is 20% now, so there has been a decrease. Uh, that still means fisheries should remain closed. What's really striking to me was this calculation. If you took the simple model, 50-day biological, uptake and then re-release of cesium, what should it look like had there been no continued source? So if the source had stopped April 1st when we had that big pulse, we would have seen cesium decrease like this in fish. It is not happening. They are still high. Whether it's, uh, I'll show you the number, is 50% in 330 days. That's my calculation from that data. It's certainly of concern and the reason why uh, those fisheries are closed. So my final summary of, of what I hope to get across today and then I have kind of a promotion of what comes next, but I think we've learned quite quickly that it was an unprecedented event for the oceans. Uh, I think there's many reasons we want to study this. There's the human health aspects for the dose. There's the radioecology. We know so little about those fish. Why are some higher than others on the same day, the same types, the same time? And certainly we want to do a better job in modeling and predicting. No one can predict today what's going to happen to those fish levels off Fukushima with any certainty. Uh, I do like to make the point that Japan is leading most of the studies in the oceans, uh, but more work is needed than they could do or any one lab should be doing, and that that confirmation we talked earlier about international independent labs, we hope, I hope, that I'm building some confidence in the data and to the public, and at the same time we increase the science that we know. Uh, my big pitch these days is we just can't keep measuring the fish. You can measure fish till the cows come home, but you're not gonna understand when are they gonna be low enough, when is it gonna be safe to be consuming these fish. And certainly, though I will say stepping back from that, it's easier to measure how much cesium is in fish than to do things like we've been hearing about health effects from them. Uh, so my hat's off to that. And my pitch is that we're gonna try and on May 9th have a, another public event like we had in Tokyo. So these are short presentations on a panel. It will end up with a production, a hard copy issue of Oceanus from my institution. And so you can look forward to that. You can find out more about it online now. Uh, I'll try and make sure that website's available so we don't have to scribble it down. And like many others here, we're trying to kind of extend our mission out now. And so we're trying to establish a center that would have 
some longer-term vision of looking forward at the consequences of having these natural and human-made sources of these radionuclides in the environment, in this case, the oceans. Thank you.